Welcome to the Ashby Tabletop Gamers review of Combat Commander Europe. This game has been produced by GMT Games. It's one of a series of games representing World War II tactical infantry combat. This specific game is focused on Europe, as you probably would have guessed, and in particular it deals with combat between the German and Russian forces uh, on the Eastern Front and between the German and the American forces on the Western Front. If you're interested in playing other nationalities, in particular British Commonwealth or Empire troops, um, French uh, and Belgian forces and Italians, uh, you'll need to buy a second uh, box game uh, called Combat Commander Mediterranean. This is the box for Combat Commander Mediterranean. This game um, is about the same sort of price as Combat Commander Europe, a little bit more expensive actually, um, and introduces new scenarios and new, f and new counters, new forces. There is also a third game called Combat Commander Pacific, and you may well guess that th this game deals with the US Marine Corps, combats against the Japanese. Um, there are other games uh, that you can buy, uh, in particular one called Combat Commander Resistance, uh, but you don't need to buy any of those games and um, Combat Commander Europe is a, um, a standalone game in its own right. Having got Combat Commander Europe um, you can also get add-on games um, which are not full boxes but they are called battle packs. Um, they're only about £20 or less in, in some cases and there's no counters in these battle packs. This is uh, the first battle pack uh, called Paratroopers. It's got 11 new scenarios uh, with four new maps and obviously, obviously it reuses some of the old maps, uh, the original maps in Combat Commander Europe. You don't need to buy anything else uh, in order to play all of those uh, scenarios in Paratroopers. However, there's another battle pack called Sea Lion this represents the hypothetical invasion of the United Kingdom by Germany in 1940. This uh, does require Combat Commander Mediterranean as well as Europe to play. It introduces 10 new scenarios uh, and each scenario has a unique map. It, they represent um, a story really um, from the initial invasion um, in, on the south coast through to fighting in London, fighting actually on, in Trafalgar Square, which as, as a Brit that's quite, um, that's quite interesting, something you don't normally see in a game. But you don't have to buy any of those games, you don't have to buy any of these add-ons. Uh, Combat Commander Europe itself uh, could keep you playing games for a very long time. If we open up the box, you'll see that this is the second printing, 2008 printing. You can, normally can buy this game for about £50 um, from uh, online or game shops. At the moment it does seem to be out of print and therefore it's retailing at over £100. That to me seems ridiculous. Hopefully by the time you see this they'll be back in stock and back to £50 again. If, however, um, the game is still retailing at a stupid price, do look out for second-hand versions of either this second printing or the earlier first printing, which looks almost identical. Actually, it's the figures on the box that are different. The first printing, the rules are almost identical. Uh, for all plain purposes, they are. It's, it's only that there are, there are some errors in the rules, really, and this second edition puts those errors right. Um, in most cases, the er the errors um, you, you you can you can the the errata shows what they are, and they, it's pretty easy to get to get it, get it um, to be able to put that right. Inside the box, then you get uh, three decks of cards. These are called fate cards. Um, the first one, uh, in this case, is a Russian fate deck, and you'll see each nationality not only gets its own counters, but it also gets uh, its own fate deck as well, which is very important to the way the game plays. Um, so obviously the Russians get their fate deck, the American troops get um, their fate deck, and finally of course the German troops get their fate deck. There is also um, a card called the initiative card, which is a very interesting concept, um, which um, adds a little bit of fun to the game. You get um, a counter um, uh, tray 
which is very nice touch. Um, I'm fed up of trying to find counters um, in the bottom of a box, it's not very helpful. And this enables you to at least uh, sort out the most commonly used counters. And you'll see I've punched quite a few counters already playing the games that I have played. Um, besides the counters, you get the orders of battle uh, for the three um, main countries in this case, uh, American, German and Russian. And these orders of battle enable you to create um, randomised scenarios, um, at, if, you, if you wish, featuring comparatively historical forces. So for instance it shows you the counters that you would use and the points uh, required in order, to, for instance, to have a veteran uh, rifle company or a paratrooper company for the Americans and you can uh, pit those um, against uh, appropriate German units as well, pioneer companies and elite rifle units and SS and so on. And then on the reverse of those, uh, this is something you would play during in the game, this is a part that's useful in the game, is the support tables. As part of the game it randomises the arrival of reinforcements and those reinforcements are represented by um, what is a, a dice roll and so um, it's 2d6, so a number between 2 and 12, and um, you cross-index them against uh, a date, effectively, and it gives you a choice of different uh, forces that can arrive at that time. And sometimes uh, the forces can change the, um, the play of the game, and it, it, therefore there are victory points, there's a victory point cost, and, which is shown, you can see in bold here, uh, two, three, four, five, and indeed uh, some extreme, uh, extremely effective units, six victory point cost. Next we have the rule book. This is version 1.1, the main difference between the second printing and the first printing. It's a very comprehensive set of rules, but quite a short book. It's only 24 pages, and in order to play the game, actually you probably only have to read uh, about 12, 13 pages initially before you can start a game. A lot of the book um, is examples of play and therefore um, it's, it's pretty easy to get through this to be honest. Don't be put off by the size of that um, and indeed if anybody has played squad leader or advanced squad leader which looks a similar type of game to this you will know that the rules in those games are significantly more complicated than this. Next we have the playbook which is the details of the scenarios, the different scenarios that are, that are played in this box. There are 12 scenarios, each played on a different map, and this book tells you how to set up those scenarios, and in particular it gives the specific forces used in this case scenario 6, the German forces and the American forces used that go with the, the map, map 6, and it tells you how to set up the, the game. And that is replicated for all the scenarios. But also, it does have a random scenario generator, which really enables you to play this game over and over again. Each of the individual scenarios is uh, replayable many, many times. But on top of that, the random scenario generator really means this isn't one single game, but it's many, many games, and you get hours of uh, fun <laughs> playing this. Next, we have the track display. Now, this is a single-sided um, piece of card. Um, obviously, if you flipped it over, any counters on it would fall off, so it's, it's only single-sided. But this represents the... Um, keeping track of the different um, victory conditions and so on within the game and also it it does give you a, a, a little bit of an, an aid memoir for um, d different counters within the game we'll look at the counters in a minute and this saves you having to look uh, into the rule book too too often and indeed as you get more used to the game you'll find all the information you need to play the game is either on the cards or indeed on one of these sheets. So this is the track display, but we also have the um, 
a, a, a specific sheet for each player. It's two of these sheets, uh, both the same. Uh, just to remind you about what a squad is like and um, uh, the different uh, things that uh, can be triggered on a card. And then on the other side of that is the classic um, terrain chart showing um, the different map symbols and what those symbols are called in the rules and the effect that those different map symbols have on movement, on cover, on line of sight and then spe specific notes. Again, it's probably everything you need to know about the rules in there. Finally, paper terms, we have the maps themselves. There are 12 different scenarios, so we have six double-sided maps. I'll just show you a couple of these. Um, this is the first scenario, which is a, a Russian Eastern Front scenario uh, with a meeting of forces. You can see a forest section and um, a couple of buildings and a pond and so on. And then on the other side, we have um, a bocage um, scenario. This is the Americans against the Germans, obviously, in Normandy. And you can see that these maps are totally independent. They don't go together. I'll just show you a couple of map boards from squad leader or advanced squad leader, and you'll see some major differences. First of all, these hexagons that are imprinted on the map these are significantly larger. They're about twice the size in length compared to the squad leader hexes and that means they're almost four times the size in area and um, also the squad leader maps interestingly uh, were geomorphic in other words you could arrange them to put them together in different ways and uh, the roads would meet up and so on and the trees and uh, you could turn those around and they would join together and you can make massive map boards oh, quite good fun but uh, the maps that we have for Combat Commander don't do that. Uh, they have a border and the playing area is a playing area. It is 10 hexes wide by 15 hexes deep, 150 hexes, and uh, that's all you play on. It's quite a confined space and that, that does um, is represented really by the fact that this is small unit tactics there are no tanks involved in the game, there's no vehicles at all, any aeroplanes uh, and artillery are normally abstracted in their effect. Um, that's, that makes the games play comparatively quickly. I think the, the, they suggest the games take one to three hours. Uh, there are many games that say that they take up to three hours and you can normally double that time. But in this case, they're pretty well right. Um, most games you can probably get done within well within three hours. We also have the counter sheets, and these have been punched out as you can see, but these are large counters and again let's compare them to the maps. So you can see that um, hexes are big enough that you can have different piles of counters within a hex which is very helpful. The counters, these are the, these are the actual um, unit counters and they are basically uh, you've got leaders and heroes, you've got, uh, and you've got different types of squad, um, and um, you can, the, 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 the pictures show quite graphically um, what the, the size of the units, so it's easy to spot which units are which, and then the, uh, obviously the information on is printed quite large, and as you get older you find that it's quite a helpful thing. Besides the two sheets of uh, counters uh, for the units, we also have a sheet of one single sheet of counters showing ordnance, uh, machine guns, mortars, and so radios, and so on, and also um, the sheet of um, markers. Uh, so there's fortifications, mines, and wire, and bunkers, and so on, but also um, uh, victory conditions, which is a, a, a very good part of the game. Now we'll come on to uh, a demonstration, a quick demonstration of how the rules work and um, uh, uh, setting up a game. I've set up here scenario number two, hedgerows and hand grenades. This is a an American attack in Normandy in July 1944. You can see that 
it takes up quite a lot of space really. The map itself is quite large and you also have to have the trap display as well. You need space for cards, the counter tray and obviously each player has their own cards um, for combat results and so on. Um, it can't make, be made much smaller than this. The track display and the map are oriented in particular ways so that the German player sits on that side of the table and the American player sits on that side of the table. And that corresponds to the map edges for their troops. And it matters because of who comes on and when they come on and which direction, particularly reinforcements can, can come on. And also the track display is oriented in a particular way because the tracks go off in different directions and um, the one direction is towards the German player showing German points and the other direction is towards the Allied player showing Allied points. Here we have the starting forces for each side shown. The German forces on the left they have four leaders uh, three Volksgrenadier squads, five conscript squads, a couple of heavy machine guns and a couple of light machine guns. The American forces, representing uh, historical forces of the time, only have three leaders, but they have two elite squads and six line squads, together with a weapons team, a medium machine gun, a light mortar and a radio with access to 105mm off-board artillery, um, which can be introduced later in the game. The track display is set up according to the instructions. The year marker is 1944 and that determines the type of reinforcements that might arrive. The victory point marker begins on the 10 space on the axis side. I'll explain why in a second. The time track marker starts at zero. In some games the time doesn't start at zero, it can start at a higher number. That does, it is important, uh, the interplay of the starting point and the sudden death marker which is when the game might end the higher the number on the sudden death marker the more likely the game is to end it is not certain to end and this is one of the the great things about the game you don't know how long any particular turn is going to take and you don't know how many turns you have to last out or have in order to carry out an objective it's not a fixed number of turns and that does make you play differently to those games where you know that you have to do something by turn six. So this is one of the good things about this game. Um, next we have the troop quality and number of orders. The German troops are green troops but they get four orders and the American troops are line troops which are better but they only get three orders. In other words the Americans have better quality but can do less with their units. Next we have the posture. The Allies are attacking and the Germans are defending and this determines the number of cards held in the hand by each player. An attacking player gets six cards in his hand and the defending player only gets four cards in their hand. Then we have the objective chips. Now, as I said, the Germans have ten points and that's the, the open objective, which everybody knows about, says that each of the map locations are worth two objectives. Now, you'll see the map in a minute, but the map contains five locations numbered one, two, three, four, and five. And this says that each of those five locations is worth two points. And later on it says that the Germans begin with all the locations under their control. So by definition, the Germans begin with 10 victory points. But to add a, a, a fog of war element, there are two secret objectives, one for the Allied side and one for the Axis side. Now, the Allies know this, but the Germans don't, and that is that um, objective number four is also worth three additional victory points. So it's not just the two, but it's an extra three on top of it, and the Germans don't know that. Interestingly, the Germans, they know that objective number five is also worth an additional three victory points. So neither side knows all of the victory points, and, they, and um, although there's a limited number of um, of different markers, it, it, they're quite varied in what they could be. And next we know that the um, the Allies set up uh, three hexes deep first and then the Axis set up second, twelve hexes deep. In order to stop the Axis just, just totally counter-attacking and overwhelming the Americans in a particular area by setting, setting up second, there's a special rule that allows one of the Allied um, leaders with a radio to set up anywhere on the board and this the ability to bring down artillery fire 
um, can create a very bad day for the Germans if he, if he can catch them in, a, in, in particular areas, uh, normally in trees, for instance, or in the open. And that, that, that rule does stop the Germans from massing for a, a very quick counter-attack. The terrain is, uh, uh, is in Normandy, and this is Bocage country, and normally hedgerows um, give a plus one modifier to uh, firing through them. In this case it's a plus two modifier because the Bocage hedges are thicker and larger and they've got big uh, earth banks and so on, so they do provide more cover. And uh, finally we know that the ally player takes the first turn. We can see here the American forces set up with a strong attack in the center and on the left. And that's supported from the right hand side by um, a medium machine gun and a mortar. And both of these weapons are set up to make use of the comparatively long lines of fire that they have into the German positions. The Germans meanwhile set up some sort of defense in depth um, with the units hopefully able to fall back using the hedgerows for cover. You can see strong German forces around two of the objective hexes which are uh, the red circles numbers three and four. You remember that they on the face of it are worth four victory points. Here we can see an example of two squads, an American squad front and back. This is a line unit and a German squad front and back. This is a Volksgrenadier unit. Each counter shows five pieces of information. The first is the stacking uh, number for the unit, which is the number of figures on the card. That's four in the case of a squad. And the stacking restriction for a hex is seven. So clearly you can't have more than one squad in a hex. You can't have two squads in a hex. Um, then we have three numbers which are the basis for combat which is the firepower, the range and then the movement and some of those numbers are, are, are boxed and that gives extra benefits to a unit and you can see the boxes are different for these two units. The reverse of the counter is the unit after it has suffered some casualties or effects of combat the reverse is obviously um, a lower uh, uh, value set of figures, but in this case, interestingly, the American morale, which is six on an unbroken side and eight on the broken side, is actually higher. It's more normal for a unit to have the same morale on both sides, or in, in the case of the German Volksgrenadier, it's a, a more brittle unit. It's got a higher morale uh, on the unbroken side, but once it's become broken, it drops to a lower number. This is meant to reflect the fact that the American units uh, in 1944 at least were more liable to drop and take cover uh, uh, but then would be uh, able to come back again, back into the fight quite easily. I'm not convinced by that um, but it, it does add to the game so it, it makes it more interesting. This, this German unit is, is tougher up front but once it's broken it's less likely to come back again. Here we have the counters for two leaders. The top one is the unbroken side of a German sergeant and the bottom one is the reverse side, the broken side for an American sergeant. We have the same information as for a squad, so we have the stacking which is one in this case and then we have the three basic um, combat numbers, so um, firepower in the first number, range the second number and movement the third and also we have morale on the top right in each case. There's an additional number for a leader which is the leadership number which is the number in the hexagon just below morale. In the case of both actual counters on the, on, on the front side it's two and then on the broken side it's always zero. These, this leadership number is extremely important in the game because the way the game works is you have to give orders to specific counters or you can give orders to a leader and the leader can pass those orders on to any other counter within its leadership uh, range. And it, obviously a range of two means that, um, that these leaders are very powerful because they can control units in their own hex, which is zero range, in, in an adjacent hex or even a hex further away. 
And so these units, uh, these leaders can actually control large numbers of units. Many other leaders only have a, a leadership range of one. So the important thing now we have to look at is giving orders. At the start of the game, each player draws a number of cards from his specific fate deck. So the American player draws cards from the American fate deck and the German player draws cards from the German fate deck. Um, the number of cards you draw depends upon whether or not you're attacking on reconnaissance or defending. The attacker gets six cards, a reconnaissance uh, force gets five cards, and the defending force gets four cards. In this case, the Americans are attacking, so into their hand they draw six cards. Now these cards are not shown to the opponent. So although um, we'll see both sets of cards here, um, clearly you'd, you won't actually know what your opponent has got. And the Germans draw four sets of cards since they are defending in this scenario. Now the cards have lots of information on them, but when the card is in your hand, there's only two parts of the card that is important. The first one is the very top action, which says, sorry, the very top order, which in this case on each of the six cards the Americans have, they have um, two artillery requests, a fire card, a command confusion, which actually is a, a useless card when it comes to order, you can't use it for anything, uh, but it does have other effects below that, and uh, two move cards. And the Germans, their orders are advance, another command confusion, an artillery request, which isn't any of use to the Germans because they don't have a radio counter in this game, and a fire card, which is just as well because as a defender you do need to be able to fire. The other part of the card that's useful from your hand is the action, and an action amends an order in some way or other. So for instance, um, we have a crossfire action here, and it says adds plus two when firing at a moving target. So if you can give a, a, a fire order to one of your units, which is shooting at a moving target, you can also play the crossfire card to add plus two to this. Now, on your turn, you get to use up to the limit of the number of orders you can have. The Americans can use three orders and the Germans could use all four, um, which is unlikely but possible. In, on the Americans' turn, therefore, they could put down, they could use one of these cards to put down some fire from maybe the machine gun or from the mortar. They could uh, ask for artillery support from the artillery request and then they could also, with their third order, they could do, use one of the move cards to move some units up. And don't forget, the order would be given to a leader, and there was a leader, a Sergeant Smith, who had a plus two uh, leadership range, so in that case he, um, he could move himself and also a number of different squads as well in that move. Now, when the enemy forces, when the attacking forces uh, play their hand of cards, um, if one of those is movement, then the uh, defending force can use an opportunity fire effectively. He doesn't have to use it and he can, he can always wait and save his fire card because uh, as a defender you get a limited number of cards but he might decide to to fire at a, a unit moving so he would he would actually use a fire card in his part of the turn uh, as the enemy unit is moving and uh, adding to his fire he has a number of actions which he could do including two here for sustained fire which adds plus two to firing a machine gun for instance. You will also see that the card shows a dice roll, which it's actually a picture of the two dice, and um, they show the two separate dice because in some cases you add the two together as sort of a classic 2d6, and in other cases you multiply the dice together, uh, which is a, a, a different way of doing it, and therefore they show the dice not as a to combined total, but as the two dice to show it separately. And there is an event, and finally there is um, a hex identifier. When a unit fires, you roll a dice, but there are no dice in this game, so what that really means is you draw a new card, and say the Americans fired, their roll in this case would be four. Now there's no other effect from that roll, but if they um, pulled this card from the top of the deck, that roll is six, and also an event. So before you carry out the effects of the attack, you look at the next card in line to see what the event might be. And in this case, the event says, Shell Shock, break the unit closest to a random hex. Now, 
In order to determine the random hex, you then draw another card, and the random hex in this case is hex C8. And you will notice, you might notice, that all of the American cards random numbers are even numbers, and all of the German card random numbers are odd numbers, which means every hex on the map, virtually every hex on the map, is given a random number. So the cards have two effects. They add an element of chance into the game, both through the dice rolls and also the odd event that happens, um, and they also enable you to carry out orders and do things with your units. There is nothing worse than having a hand of cards that allows you to do nothing. And this is one of the next aspects of the game which is particularly pleasing. The different nationalities can discard a number of cards from their hands. In the case of the Germans, they could discard up to six cards, which in this case is more than they have in a hand. But if they were the attacker, obviously, they could discard all six cards. Um, likewise, the Americans can discard five cards from their hand, and the British and Commonwealth forces could discard four cards from their hand, and the Russians can discard three, and so on. And clearly, your ability to discard cards is very important because you can replace those cards, those useless cards probably, with a set of much better cards, but it takes your turn to do it. So you give up the ability to, to fire or shoot or move or um, uh, rally units, and uh, instead you replace the, uh, a number of cards from your hand. We therefore have a situation where a commander has to decide whether or not to do something with the cards in his hand if there's a limited amount he can do, or alternatively to replace the cards and pass the initiative on to the other side. This is the crux of the game in reality, is this decision as to what to do with the, what, you can, what you've got available and, or whether or not to let your opponents take the initiative and you take a, a new set of cards. Finally, the random nature of drawing cards also determines the turn um, timing because you'll see that on some of the cards there is actually, um, on the dice roll, there is time in red box. That means that that is the end of one turn and clearly the end of one turn might happen very quickly or it might take a long time. You might draw a large number of cards before time is called. Now. There is another occasion when time moves, which is when you pass through the whole of your hand of cards. There are 72 cards in there, and um, if you're on the defence, for instance, it might take a long time to get through 72 cards. However, if you're on the attack, you might get through 72 cards very quickly. And this works against an attacker, clearly, uh, who has time against him, and also works against the defender, who is trying, probably trying to hold on against the odds, and, but, but not having the ability to push time on. So, Combat Commander has the map and counters of a conventional World War II war game. But you don't have the luxury of an armchair general, knowing exactly what you have to do, where your forces are, and where your opponents are. In this case, you may not even know exactly what forces you've got, let alone your opponent. You certainly don't know how long the game is going to last. The command system, the card system, that is used adds a different opponent. You have to work with the cards and in spite of the cards. You have to make the most of a hand, not just the forces that are available to you. And this game creates a whole new narrative to a war game. You actually feel differently about the counters because you're striving against lots of odds. It's not just against your opponent. And that adds an extra level, an extra dimension to these games. It's not for nothing that this game has been voted the favourite World War II game um, recently. The games are easy to learn and quick to play and I think most importantly of all they are immense amounts of fun. It's a long time since I can say that a World War II war game has been fun to play as well as interesting and illuminating. The game is so popular that it shouldn't be too difficult to find opponents and if there are nobody in your local area you can use the online vassal system to find opponents over the internet. 
And if you don't fancy that, you can play the game solo. It says on the back of the box that solo suitability is very low, but with some minor amendments to the rules, actually it's very easy to play this solo, and because of the narrative structure of the turns, it is still very good fun. Any downsides to this game? Most people mention that there are no tanks and no vehicles. That's not really a downside, I don't believe. That's not what this game's about. It's not a highly accurate analysis of the Battle of Normandy or the Battle of Stalingrad. It's more like the story of a group of soldiers who are caught up in something that's much bigger than them. And because of that, it is a great deal of fun.